Hello, I'm Colin Scow and welcome back to Data Lit. Data science is all about taking measurements of something that's happening in the world, analyzing the data collected, and then making extrapolations and predictions. And central to making solid predictions about data is the central limit theorem. But before we get into that, it's important that you understand the basics of probability and distributions. So here's a crash course. A random variable is the result of a chance event that you can measure or count. And living in Las Vegas makes me an automatic expert on the subject. <laughs> there are two and a half types of random variables. Discrete variables are potentially embarrassing information that you'd rather other people not know. Like the number of speeding tickets you really have when you're trying to get cheap car insurance. But in data science, nobody cares about those, except in companies like Facebook that make money selling that kind of data. Plus, I just made that term up. What really matters for probability are discrete random variables. Note the different spelling. Those are things you can count in whole numbers, like the number of lemons made by a tree, or the number of lemons made by Ford, or the number of limes consumed by Mexican restaurants on Cinco de Mayo. On the other hand, continuous random variables are measurements that can be expressed with high accuracy, like the weight of lemons from a tree in grams, or the amount of tears shed by LA Rams fans in gallons after losing the Super Bowl. A population refers to the entirety of what is being studied. If you're doing research on heart disease, the population might be every single person who has been diagnosed in the last year. But if your study is on millennial data science YouTubers with more than a half a million subscribers, your population would only be Siraj. Generally, it's too expensive and time consuming to research the entire population. So that's why researchers generally pick a random sample much smaller than the total population. In the case of Siraj, I just took a random biopsy of his brain matter and it made me smart enough to co-teach this course. What's most important about sampling is that the sample be legitimately chosen at random from the entire population. For example, how did pollsters like the Huffington Post get the last U.S. election so wrong? They called random numbers from a phone book. What could go wrong with that? Well, only landlines are listed in the phone book. And who still has a landline and actually answers it? I don't know for sure, but obviously they don't represent the average voter. Lesson. If the sample isn't random, you have very skewed results. So now it's time to move on and talk about probability distributions. A probability distribution is a function that helps you estimate the probability of any measurement within your population being within a specific range. To understand how it works, it is much easier to think with discrete variables. And we can turn continuous values into discrete ones by dividing them into buckets say lemon weight rounded to the nearest gram, or we could even do five gram buckets. Now, one important aspect of probability distributions is that the measurements need to be independent of each other. A coin toss is a perfect example. Even if you get five heads in a row, the next toss still has a 50-50 chance of being either heads or tails. Stock prices, on the other hand, don't work well because there is a temporal dependence. This also means that if you're over 25 and still live with your parents, you're disqualified from being part of a normal distribution. So let's work with a real life example. Say you're a data scientist with too much time on your hands, and you're flying to a data science conference and you want to choose the airline least likely to arrive late. You have several hours to analyze the problem at home, but are severely allergic to airport waiting lounges, so you don't want to be there any longer than you have to. So we're going to download a data set of historical arrival delays for more than 300,000 flights. And we'll plot each airline on a separate chart so we can compare them. The x-axis will have the delay time. The range of the data is 60 minutes early to 120 minutes late. On the x-axis, we'll divide our data into 5-minute bins. On the y-axis, we have the number of flights that fit within that bin. And we've created what's called a histogram. Now, how do we transform this into a probability distribution? Simply divide each column by the total number of samples and we get the precise probability of a single flight arriving within that time window. 
So which airline is most likely to get to your destination on time? The one with the lowest bars on the right side of the graph. Now there's only one flaw modeling flight delays by probability distribution. Have you figured it out? The samples aren't completely independent as previous delays can cascade and cause future delays. But the data still works fine for the purposes of this lesson. Now we're going to move on. What you just generated was an actual probability distribution. But there are also several models which approximate real world probability distributions really well when you don't have perfect data. There are several options and I'll leave a link to more information in the description. But the most common is a normal distribution, otherwise known as a bell curve. This models natural processes like the weight of fruit and the height of trees exceptionally well. It is also extensively used in manufacturing to measure things like deviations in the weight of a lug nut. And it also works quite well for modeling human performance for everything from athletics to academic test results. In general, any outcome which is affected by a large number of factors and thus appearing to be random is modeled well by the normal distribution. Let's make some observations about the normal distribution. First, it's shaped like a bell curve. You'll notice it has a single peak in the middle. Most of the values occur near the mean. It's also symmetric. Half the values are above the mean, half the values are below the mean. And the probability tapers off as we move further from the mean. A normal distribution is defined by the mean denoted by the Greek character mu and the standard deviation denoted by the Greek character sigma. The mean is the average of all measurements. The standard deviation is a measure of how spread out the distribution is. If you're not completely familiar with standard deviations and how to calculate them, I'm going to have a link in the description to a very simple explanation. To turn any data set into a normal distribution, all you have to do is calculate the mean and the standard deviation of the data. Now you can put in any arbitrary measurement range like between 12 and 14 minutes late and get a precise probability. All right, are you ready to push your knowledge of probability to the limit? Let's say you're doing a study on cockroaches and need to take some measurements. Well, it would be cost prohibitive to measure every single cockroach in the world. That's where the central limit theorem becomes useful. The gist of the central limit theorem is that we can take a random sampling of cockroaches and as long as they are randomly selected and the samples are big enough, the mean of our samples will closely approximate the mean of the entire population, which makes the study a lot cheaper to conduct. The central limit theorem is concerned with the sampling distribution of the mean. In other words, it's talking about repeatedly taking random samples of size n, where n is a large number, uh, usually above 30 works quite well, and calculating the mean for each of the samples. Then we look at the distribution of those means and can come to four conclusions. One, the sampling distribution of the mean will be less spread than the values in the population from which the sample is drawn. Two, the sampling distribution will be well modeled by a normal distribution and it will get closer with larger sample sizes. Number three, the spread of the sampling distribution is related to the spread of the population values. The mean of the sample is approximately the same as the population mean, and the standard deviation is going to be the standard deviation of the entire population divided by the square root of the number of samples used. And finally, bigger samples lead to a smaller spread in the sampling distribution, which, if you look at the equation above, that's self-evident. All right, wizards, it's time for your homework assignment. This one comes in two parts. Post your answers in the comments inside the lesson labeled Homework Assignment. I highly recommend using Google Colab. Save your workbook to a GitHub repository. The first person to solve the whole thing and leave a link to their workbook will get a huge shout out and I'll post their work for the entire class to admire. Part 1. Follow the histograms and density plots in Python tutorial link below to figure out which airline is most likely to get you to your destination on time. Tell us which airline you chose and why. Part 2. Use the same airline data to demonstrate or disprove the four aspects of the central limit theorem given above. Hint. 
you'll need to take repeated random samples of a specific size and measure the mean and spread or standard deviation of each one. Graph your results. Does it look like a normal distribution? And how does the sample size affect your results? Man, who could be calling me just as I'm trying to finish recording a lesson? Hello? Hey Colin, remember that random sample brain matter biopsy I gave you last week for your research? Well, I'm working on my sports prediction lesson and having trouble coming up with good jokes, so I'm going to need that back. Thanks a bunch. Oh man, this one I was on a roll, Siraj wants his brain cells back. Well, I'm counting on you class to do well on this homework assignment. And remember, the first wizard to post a correct solution is going to get famous. This is Colin Scow, and I'll be back next week for an exciting deep dive into data visualization. Until then, happy computing, and I look forward to seeing your notebooks.